Scott, I'd like to start uh, first with the topic of the poly crisis. So this is not a, a term that I've coined, but uh, it posits that there's overlapping crises where the the whole is is worse than the sum of the parts. And I think as we see Asia and the Pacific moving out of the COVID-19 pandemic, experiencing unemployment, uh, reduction of tourism, uh, layered on top of that is the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, with uh, food and energy price inflation, supply chain disruption. And layered on top of that, of course, you have uh, climate change, uh, extreme heat, droughts, uh, floods, increased disease. So this is the, the poly crisis that I think our members are experiencing. How do you see uh, our uh, role as MDBs uh, addressing that poly crisis? Are we equipped uh, to do that? Well, I think you're exactly right in outlining um, sort of the, the multiple array of issues. Um, I do think poly crisis is a good term both in describing the scale of potential uh, bad outcomes, uh, but also the complexity of, as you said, this layering. We don't really know how these issues will, will interact with each other. So there's tremendous uncertainty, I think, in the current environment. I think a lot of observers have, have suggested that to an unprecedented degree um, to see the interaction of so many factors um, that are, you know, some form of, of negative economic shock to developing economies. I think for the MDBs, uh, the leading challenge is, is, is how to act in the face of uncertainty. But one, you know, much clearer aspect of this agenda is ensuring that uh, these institutions are prepared to act. And critically, from a resource perspective, are they resourced adequately? Um, do they have the right instruments? Um, in the face of events um, that, that they can step in quickly and be responsive to their members. There are particular challenges with the institutions and, and their own membership, their shareholders, in, in how they perceive uncertainty and what they're prepared to do. Are they prepared to step up and provide the support these institutions will need? And I think that's uh, unfortunately, one area uh, of added uncertainty itself um, is, is uh, how, how do the shareholders see the situation? They certainly have concerns, um, but are they prepared um, to make really some of the critical decisions on behalf of the MDB so that we can see um, a very significantly scaled up uh, response to this array of crises? Um, innovation around uh, the nature of the response, and certainly a risk tolerance in, in the face of, of a lot of uncertainty. Do you take anything from the way that MDBs responded to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that could be uh, uh, useful for them moving forward in this kind of polycrisis environment? Yeah, in some ways, it, it, it's an interesting uh, test case and a very recent one. Um, interesting in the sense of you know, if we think back uh, now more than a decade, we had the global financial crisis. In some ways, you know, that was an extraordinary event itself, but in some ways it was a fairly traditional kind of crisis for the MDBs to respond to. We sort of understood the nature of it, the channels of the negative economic shocks, and, and how best to provide financing to that situation. The pandemic was something different. Um, it, it had very specific needs in a sector of the economies in terms of the direct health response and, and more broadly social support on top of just general fiscal kind of support that the MDBs know how to do. So I think there's a learning process there. And I think uh, among the MDBs, there were you know, definitely some very strong successes. There were also some failures, failures to act in a timely way, um, act in a coordinated fashion with uh, entities that, frankly, MDBs aren't used to working with, perhaps in the se health sector, around you know, really difficult questions about vaccine procurement, um, manufacturing capacity. So that is, I think, um, in a sense, that is more of a flavor of the, the much greater complexity around these, uh, this array of, of uh, challenges today, that they, a lot of them are sector-based um, so that they will uh, really call upon sectoral expertise uh, within the MDBs uh, to be working in a crisis mindset and then thinking about how to deliver responses in a timely way. 
So turning to uh, global public goods, uh, we're a regional uh, development bank. Of course, we have, let's say, global aspirations. You said that the uh, global public goods are one way that an organization like Asian Development Bank could have a more of a, a global impact or global reach. Uh, obviously, that's climate change, but do you see other global public goods that uh, would also provide that platform for ADB? Yes, of course. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I think whenever we talk about the global public goods agenda, it is simply the reality that climate really is um, a, a dominant element if we certainly think about the scale of financing involved. And here I think the ADB is, in fact, very well positioned um, to be a leader. Um, I think it's, you know, one important observation around this agenda generally is that you know, there's sort of a facile way of thinking that, uh, well, it's a global agenda and we have a global institution in Washington and the World Bank and they, they, they should lead on this. Uh, but that really misconstrues the nature of global public goods. The reality is uh, you want to address them uh, wherever the, you, know, you can generate the greatest uh, impact on a global basis. And that, that can be very localized, it can be regional, and it happens certainly on the climate agenda and, and to a degree on things like global pandemics, uh, that there's a lot to do in Asia. Um, so it matters to have an institution that is already um, certainly well established, but is looked to as a leader within the region, um, has demonstrated an ability to innovate um, and, and to do some hard thinking around how to carry forward this agenda. I mean, there's plenty to do uh, for the full array of institutions that we have. The World Bank will have to play a very prominent role, but I think there's a risk that we neglect the ways in which regional institutions, and particularly the ADB in Asia, already is a leader and can be a leader on, on these agendas um, and, and certainly should not be thinking of them as sort of following on from whatever the World Bank sets out to do. Well, we certainly see ourselves as the, the climate bank of Asia and the Pacific. And for us, uh, given the, the uh, mitigation and, uh, and the adaptation needs, uh, for us, we say the, the battle against climate change will be won or lost uh, in Asia and the Pacific. But uh, so health would be the other uh, kind of global public good, do you think would? Yeah, essentially, I think we have, with the experience of, of the last three years now, we sort of have the twin leading issues that I think are drivers of the global public goods agenda. And to some degree, that's a political uh, judgment in the sense that what is going to compel uh, countries to act and, and certainly wealthy countries who also are uh, the leading shareholders of these MDBs, um, it is very visible to any citizen of these countries the effect today that a pandemic can have and the, the ongoing effects that the, the climate crisis is having, um, you know, extremely visible in the headlines of all of our countries. So in that sense, I think they really are the defining issues around this agenda. But there are, importantly, there are ways to be thinking more broadly and more deeply uh, in terms of agendas that are, already are um, uh, being carried forward within the MDBs. If we think about within the agricultural sector, the need for research inputs uh, that are fundamentally public goods uh, that can help uh, achieve more sustainable agricultural practices. This kind of research activity is notoriously underinvested. It, it is increasingly hard to identify uh, resource flows into, um, you know, that's one example in one sector, but there are other kinds of R&D activities in other sectors where the incentives are not there for private investment on its own, certainly. And increasingly, governs, governments themselves are not allocating adequately to these kinds of activities. So, you know, there are actually a wide range of sectors that we can identify uh, as having global public good kinds of uh, needs. Um, but I think it is helpful, and in a political sense, it's helpful to take an abstract concept like this and be very concrete about it on what I, you know, really are the two leading challenges today. So finally, uh, you put forward that for MDBs to differentiate themselves in the future, it's going to come down to innovation and how they deploy resources, including concessional resources. However, you also show that the, the model for, for grant financing is, is declining over time. 
So these would seem to be in opposition. How do you see MDBs moving forward uh, in a concessional space when those resources are shrinking? Yeah, I, so I do think this is a leading challenge. I think, you know, uh, superficially, uh, they are called banks. And I think uh, that has some impact on the mindset of, of their own shareholders in the sense that do they really need ongoing contributions from us in, in terms of, uh, you know, do, is there a role for us as donors? Can't they be self-financing in a sense? And that really is counter to the needs of, of a more innovative global public goods agenda that does depend critically on grant resources, whether it is to make the financing terms of loans uh, much more attractive to countries to provide the strong incentives they will need to invest in areas that they frankly otherwise may not choose to invest. Um, and even more challengingly uh, in terms of financial implications is just the use of grants outright in some key areas, uh, again, like um, investments in, in, in R&D, where there really isn't a role for a loan. So identifying that, I, you know, I, I think it is well worth investing the time and effort and dialogue with shareholders to, to figure out what is it going to take, what's going to motivate them um, to reverse uh, what is otherwise a, a trend of, of, of shrinking donor contributions. I think, you know, to some degree, the onus is on the MDBs themselves because part of the um, understanding that trajectory uh, of declining resources is itself a reaction to a perception about declining need. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that reflects a very traditional um, understanding of the role that grants play in the MDBs, which is, uh, to support low-income countries. Um, the reality is more countries are successfully graduating out of that status. Um, so the donors look at that situation and say, well, we don't have to do as much anymore. Um, they need to be better educated on uh, what the global public goods agenda is all about and why grants are so critical uh, to making progress. I think that will be very useful for us looking at the uh uh, the grant element of our Asian uh, Development Fund uh, as we look at perhaps uh, grants for climate for adaptation mitigation for, for countries that wouldn't necessarily qualify for grants otherwise. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, you know, there is almost a fundamental change in mindset that is needed, uh, particularly for the shareholders who um, for many decades have, have seen sort of this linear path uh, for the way in which MDB client countries uh, move uh, and, you know, almost a hope that someday uh, MDBs will not need uh, to provide the kinds of resources they do. There's a reality, and I think it is certainly, you know, for any citizen in any country right now, uh, we can all understand that uh, it is not always forward progress and there are ongoing challenges and there are crises uh, that will arise inevitably um, that are uh, independent of the per capita income of any particular developing country. And the MDBs really need to be equipped and prepared to respond to those situations when they arise.